Well, I, I grew up in Niagara Falls in a, an Italian family. And it was, um, looking back, I, I kind of chuckle because I, I didn't know anybody that wasn't Italian or wasn't really in my family. Started work at a very young age. My father, when I was eight years old, said to me, um, you're not gonna be like other boys. You're gonna work. And when I was eight, he took me down to Clifton Hill where my grandmother had a restaurant. When she came over from Italy, she was one of the first people, possibly the first or second person. No, I think it was absolutely the first restaurant on Clifton Hill. And she started a restaurant. My father dug out the basement and had a souvenir store. I had an interesting grandfather and uh, he was from Calabria. And his nickname was Musa Dolce, which in his dialect meant sweet lips. And they called him Sweet Lips because um, like in the movies, when you were marked by the mob, uh, his job was to carry out the orders. I know it was you, Fredo. You broke my heart. And he actually would stalk you and come up behind you when you weren't paying attention and pl plant a kiss on the side of your face. Now you had two choices. <clears throat> you get out of town, disappear, or you had to deal with him. And if you had to deal with him, there was no tomorrow. My father was um, also kind of an interesting character. He was a, uh, a gambler. And he was uh, also connected to the boys, as we like to say. And he uh, owned racehorses. And that was right up his alley because he loved the action. The store wasn't enough for him. So he was a bookmaker and uh, he ran uh, games and they were all cheats. I mean, if you got into a, one of the games that uh, he was uh, putting on, you were a mark. And of course, the marks didn't know that they were a mark. And so you, you went there with a big pocket full of money and you left with no money in your pocket. That was not by accident. And uh, he loved that life. And um, it was a lifestyle that uh, I didn't particularly like. And when I was 12 years old, he said to me, well, you're old enough now, you have to choose which way you want to go. I knew exactly what he meant. And um, I didn't answer him right then, but <clears throat> I knew of his lifestyle and I had met his friends and I thought this is not what I want for my life. And so he motivated me to be just the opposite of what he was. But the street corner also taught me hanging around with these fellas that were on the other side of the tracks. Uh, and I, I gravitated to them because once I got to know them, I thought these are, these are just people like uh, everyday people that uh, have a sense of humor and are good guys and they were loyal and they became my best friends. But I, I realized thinking about it, uh, I remember being in the pool room day and I looked around and I thought, where are these guys gonna be? in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years. And I remember thinking that, and I remember looking at every one of them individually, and I thought, they're gonna be nowhere if they're even gonna be alive. And I thought, I have to get out of here. I have to get off of the street corner, which I loved. And I loved those guys. And the ticket out was education. I was uh, invited, uh, myself and a, a professor uh, from Brock, were invited to speak at various uh, uh, universities around the world and also the World Future Society. Uh, because while at Brock, uh, and I would, after I left the fire department, I had my BA in 1969. And again, I couldn't, I had various job offers and I couldn't move out of the city because of my wife. And so I ended up at the fire department. But I of, often thought I would like to uh, be a university professor. So I went back for my PhD and that's how I hooked up with uh, this fellow from Brock. And uh, we spoke at Oxford University and the, one of the things, I mean, that in itself, I bought this, this sweatshirt at, at Oxford. I love the town. And um, one of the, the things that thrilled me was that here I am, this little Italian guy from the streets of Niagara Falls, from the center, that, that was the scary part of town. I'm at Oxford University, not just visiting, I'm speaking at Oxford and out in the courtyard, they had a, a bench that overlooked the bell tower. And that was the spot that Sir Isaac Newton used to sit and ponder. And I sat in that very spot that Isaac Newton sat in. I thought, wow. 
Slow Pitch started, innocently enough, by a, a visit that I made to Sonny Badavanak. And just during the course of a discussion, he mentioned that his brother saw a game being played with some old guys in Florida. There was no name of the sport and there was no names mentioned, just some old guys that tossed a ball to each other so they could hit it. And that just sparked me and I said, that's it. And from that humble beginning, we developed six teams and we called it Slow Pitch. <clears throat> and I went to Toronto and registered the name and I owned Slow Pitch Canada for about 30 years. And the whole purpose was to get everyone to play and have a lot of fun. And we wanted to teach them how to run their own tournaments. We encouraged everybody to do it. We contacted them by mail, by uh, phone. We drove to, to various cities. We made a lot of contact and we said, listen, we want you guys to spread this and we'll help you in every way possible. That in a nutshell is how it started. And every year we went from six to 12 to 24 to 48. And our biggest tournament was 226 teams. We brought over 5,000 people into the city of Niagara Falls, filled the motels and the restaurants. Everybody had a great time. Well, if I had to think about a philosophy of life, is it would be a, a trying to be a good person a, above all else. Um, I, I think that as you go through life, uh, being a good person and uh, um, bringing uh, happiness and well-being to other people uh, leads to a good life for yourself. So I think that, that's my philosophy. Derive my happiness by making other people happy. Thank you.